This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. When a life is on the line, every heartbeat and each passing second is precious. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of courageous battles to survive and the heroes who try to make a difference on Rescue 911. We begin early on the morning of March 4th, 1989, in the snow-covered mountains above Great Barrington, Massachusetts. As ski instructors Louis Alessio and his 52-year-old wife Marty set out to enjoy their first run of the day. Marty and I have started skiing 20 years ago, and we've been doing it ever since. Where do you want to go this time? Oh, we'll go down that hatch. OK. It's just an enjoyable thing for the two of us to do. But that's an important part of our life, because Marty and I do things together, and we have always. <laughs> go. Good deal. That hatch is our favorite trail. We like to ski the edges, Marty on the right, I on the left. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw her start to fall. And you fall a lot when you're skiing. You slide along and, and eventually come to a stop. But she kept sliding. I was worried that she had broken her back. I was worried she had broken her neck and she wouldn't walk anymore. Ready. I looked at her. Her eyes were open. Her mouth was open. In that little time, I just couldn't believe how cold she was. No. Help! Help! I, I just couldn't believe that this had happened. I kept telling myself, don't lose your cool. She needs you now more than anything. Please. Help! Help! The only thing I said to her was, Marty, please don't leave me now. Help! 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 When we continue, Things in my head were going, you know, what am I going to do? Because we've been married for 32 years and we're a team. I don't want to lose my partner. Joe Mosa, head of the Butternut Basin Ski Patrol, immediately rushed to the scene. When I heard a ski instructor had hit a tree, I expected to see a glory mess when I got there. Jeff, go direct traffic. I didn't find what I expected. Marty was not bleeding at the time. There was no blood. OK, Marty, it's Joe. Uh, Marty, right? I'm going to feel your neck. Can you feel that at all, Marty? At that time, I started my initial survey. Down your arm. Can you feel it? Does it hurt at all, Marty? And when I felt the stomach area was very, very hard and pulsating, which meant uh, we had some internal bleeding. At that time, I became very, very worried that if we didn't get her off the hill in a hurry, that we may lose her. Lou, go down to the ski patrol. Get ready to go to the hospital. At that time, I felt that it would be better to have Lou off the hill 
So I told him to go down to the ski patrol room and get ready to assist down there when Marty came off the hill. It was hard for me to leave her, but I felt that she was in good hands with the ski patrolman. As I started down the mountain, I had a very difficult time trying to ski. My legs were just like rubber. Things in my head were going, you know, what am I going to do? Because we've been married for 32 years, and, you know, we're, we're a team. And I don't want to lose my partner. OK, move it out. Tony, go. It took us less than eight minutes to make our exam, backboard Marty, get around the uh, toboggan and take her down for the waiting ambulance. At the base of the mountain, they were met by EMT Mary Berryhill. Okay, are you awake? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, okay, okay, uh, good. Okay, let's get her in the uh, ambulance. Okay, it's gotta be count. very cold. One, two, three. Uh, straight her breathing, her facial yeah. expression, she looked frightened and her inability to, to breathe enough so that she could speak words told me that this lady was in trouble. Marty was rushed to Fairview Hospital, a small facility close to the slopes for treatment. En route, her condition continued to deteriorate. Tell me, tell me what happened. He fell, may have hit her chest. What do we got for boiling? Marty, at this point, blood pressure had dropped quite a bit. Her pulse had increased dramatically to 130, and her respirations were even more distressed and difficult. She had all the signs pointing to a very, very serious injury. What's going on, guys? Surgeon George Vinaglu was called in to examine her. She had no breath sounds on the left side of her chest, which indicated that she probably had a collapsed lung from the trauma. George, I got the chest fill. Let's see what we got. Okay. She's got a whole bunch of broken ribs here. I was very suspicious at that point that she had a fractured spleen simply because she had a lot of broken ribs on the left side. We'll go into the OR. Just before Marty was taken to surgery, her son Chuck was allowed to see her. Hi, Mom. I told her that I loved her, and I asked her to squeeze my hand just to let me know that she was listening to me and to let her know that I was there. And she responded by squeezing my hand, which was a very, very comforting for me because my mom was still there. She wasn't just a body laying on the table. She was fighting. I realized that we were going to do a major procedure and I needed a helping hand. But my associate was away that weekend, so the only doctor that was available to help me was Dr. Nemio, the gynecologist. Knife, please. We're starting. Okay. Let's get going now. Her spleen was normal. However, the diaphragm was bulging into the abdomen. And it became very obvious to me that she had a lot of blood on the right side of her chest. Okay? Just gonna explore here. Where did it happen? Friends and family waited for word of Marty's condition. I'm thinking this this can't be happening. I came thinking this is a dream. Um, why would why would this happen to my mother? And she's the nicest person in the world. She's a good skier. Um, there's no reason for this it, to be happening to someone like this. I knew it was bad because when I saw her body just come to an abrupt halt, my heart just fell to my stomach. This is this is the woman that who's raised me from a baby. And now there's nothing that I can do to help her except pray. A lot of things were going through my mind. What if she had a real major chest injury? We don't do this type of surgery at Fairview Hospital. So uh, in the back of my mind, I thought, well, maybe I should send the patient to another bigger institution where they do heart cases every day, and it's a daily routine for them. But then I thought it, thought it over again, and I said, well, if I send her anywhere else, she would be dead. And the reason is, she was so seriously injured, the time was of the essence. Okay, let's extend that incision to the right side. Just have to wait and hope that, uh, hope that, hope that the injury internally is not too bad. I started thinking about, you know, the worst thing that could happen. Uh, I actually started thinking about, you know, funeral, what, what to do. 
I had a great deal of trouble telling myself that, you know, these people are going to help her. Okay, there's a lot of blood in the right chest. We saw a pulmonary artery laceration. We put a clamp right onto that, and we got the bleeding controlled. Then I opened the sack around her heart because there was blood around her heart. And once we opened the sack, it became very obvious that a piece of the rib that was broken poked a hole in her heart. I think that's what caused the hole in her heart. We put a clamp on the right atrium, and then I put my finger on the opening that she had in the right ventricle. Uh, it stopped the bleeding, and at that point I thought, okay, we can fix this. Uh, she's going to make it. It's going to be okay. But as we were doing that, she had a cardiac arrest. Good. She's fibrillating, and let's have the paddle. I requested to get the internal paddles. They said, what internal paddles? We don't do any open heart surgery at Fairview. Everybody clear. It was a situation like MASH, a situation where we needed a lot of resources and some things that were not available, and we had to do what we had to do with what we've got. Hi, I'm Dr. Vinogu. I am Marty's husband. Dr. Vinogu came in, and he looked at me, and he said, I don't think she's going to make it. She's got a hole in her heart this big. We sewed it up, but she arrested several times, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what's going Dr. to happen. Dr. Vinoglu, I need yeah. you in the OR staff. When Dr. Vinoglu left the room, I said, that's it. She, she must have died, and uh, I've lost her. George, oh, on, All right, let's defibrillate her quickly now. Charge. Clear. Still defib. Okay, let's do it again. Go. Still defib. A nurse came in and told us that they'd like to have us go to the meditation room. Be there, so if you just gather up your things and follow me. That's the point that... I thought, well, this is where they're going to tell us the news, you know, that I've lost my wife. A nurse came in and said, we thought you'd be more comfortable here because you're going to be right by Marty. She's right down the hall in the intensive care. And with that, I had a big sigh of relief. Over the next two and a half weeks, Marty slowly recovered, but she cannot forget how close she came to dying. I remember I saw an operating table from a distance. And I couldn't see anyone's faces, but I knew that it was me on that table somehow. And I knew I had just died. And I just sort of felt, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna die. And then it was gone. The scene was gone just as quickly as it appeared. And the next thing that I uh, remember is waking up. It was very hard thinking about losing Marty. What goes through my mind now is, uh, especially when they run up to Grandma and give her a big hug and a kiss, you know, that, that makes me probably most appreciative that she's still around to enjoy all that, because uh, I wouldn't want it the other way. There's a baby in there somewhere, yeah, there he is. Miracles are made, miracles don't happen. And Dr. Vinoglu and his staff made this miracle. He's probably the, the best man I've ever met in my whole life. I, uh, I owe him the biggest debt of gratitude. He could, uh, he could ask me any favor in the world and I'd do it for him. I'd probably do it 10 times over. It doesn't matter what it is. For me to stop skiing would be like not breathing. So it was natural for me to go back to skiing. We feel that skiing is a, is a very safe sport. Uh, and this was just a freak accident. Oh, no, it's got me. <laughs> hey, how you feeling? Good. good. I feel great. Cold? So good to be back out here. Yeah. I could sit in a rocker for the rest of my life, and I would probably be safe, but that's not living. Going out and skiing is living. 
that's what I want to do, and that's what I'm going to keep doing. We'll go I want a hot chocolate. You owe me. Okay, I owe you a hot chocolate. <laughs> yeah. That's a deal. Okay. <laughs> Next. A lot of people think it can't happen in their city, but almost every major city across the country is experiencing some gang problems. Tommy! Once every 15 minutes, someone in America is the victim of a shooting. With random acts of gun violence on the rise, our streets are becoming increasingly littered with broken hearts and shattered dreams. This story is not a recreation. It's the terrible reality faced by the Oklahoma City emergency workers on the night of August 4, 1991. On that night, we had had several shootings that occurred in our city involving gang members. I feel like the mood was set for that evening. 10.20 p.m., a taxi dispatcher radios the police for help. This is Mary Gum Uh-huh. I have a driver being shot at at Southwest 29. I don't think he was hit. He said something about maybe the car was hit. We drove up on this shooting right after it had occurred. So the chances were good that the suspects were still on the street. Lincoln 206 headquarters. Have you got an M care to 521 on uh, 29th? Got a shooting victim here. Can you tell me what happened? Did somebody just drive by or what? Yeah. Yeah. No, they were in a little gray car. They went to a little They were talking 90 miles an hour, but of course we needed to get information out on the radio as quickly as possible. A small gray car, a big gray car? It was a small gray car. It was a sedan. It was a Lawrence. It might have been, it might have been like a Chevy Nova. It looked like a Chevy Nova. Okay, and it went that way. It was a new car. The thing that was unusual that would make the car stick out to us was the fact that it had lights that surrounded the license tag that went around and around the tag. Kind of small, possibly like a Nova. And the rear of the vehicle will have a Christmas tree type uh, decoration going around the tag. And this occurred about three minutes ago. He was trying to hang on. It was obvious you could see his hands moving. It was a total just fight to stay conscious. The victim does not belong to any gang that we're aware of. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. So y'all were going down the road when it happened? Right. They passed us on shields and turned around and followed us. Put up beside the car, pulled out the gun, and shot, and shot us. They shot shots. twice. And all he could do is keep on saying, help me, help me. And then we got him out and took him over to where he could be away from the car and waited. Is he doing okay? Come on, Tommy. What's his name? Tommy. 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 Move Talk to me, bud. You okay? Keep on moving your hand, Tommy. Tommy, move your hand. Tommy. Tommy. Come on, Tommy. Tommy. Tommy, you still with me? <laughs> Tommy Bias is rushed to a nearby trauma center, barely clinging to life. When the young victim arrives at South Community Hospital, a trauma team is standing by, led by Dr. Brent Waters. He has a single gunshot wound to the skull, conscious but not really alert. It's a little early to say what will happen with him right now. He may have irreversible brain damage. This is always one of the hardest aspects of this job. Loretta, my name is Carol Cotton. I'm the director in the emergency department at South Community Hospital. Do you have a son by the name of Tommy Bias? I need for you to come to the emergency department. He has been critically injured. He's been shot. I can't think of anything more horrible than waking up to a phone call that says your son or your child or your family member has been critically injured. It's just a tragedy. 
Okay, it drives safely, though. Please, okay, bye-bye. We had three gunshot wounds earlier, two now, so that's five tonight. And gang members in the hospital here for retribution and a break-in in the pharmacy. It's a little more intense than usual, but not, not out of the ordinary. At 11 p.m., a second gunshot victim is brought into the same trauma room. Officer Lori Cruz had responded to that shooting. The victim had been shot through the hand, which had gone into his leg. His friends stated they were going to follow him to the hospital. Yeah, squeeze my fingers for me. Squeeze them. Squeeze them. Good. Relax. I waited in my vehicle until they started their car and then observed the rotating lights around the tag. We got a positive ID on the shooter. When the vehicle started up, we saw the marquee lights come on on the tag. We drew our weapons. They offered absolutely no resistance and the suspects were placed in the back of the police vehicles. Uh, one of Tommy's friends positively identified the passenger of the vehicle as being the shooter in Tommy's shooting. Tommy's mother, Loretta Bias, arrives at the hospital. Loretta, let me tell you what to expect when you go in and see Tommy, okay? We he's also have, no, he is in a way and not responding. Now you need to understand, I can't tell you whether he can hear you or not. <laughs> And what I also need to tell you is that the brain scan we talked about out there does not look good. And we can't take Tommy to surgery. Okay, there's too much damage. What happens is when the bullet goes in, it makes a very small hole. And once it goes into the brain, it explodes and it's done a tremendous amount of damage. If Tommy survives, the suspects will probably be prosecuted for what we would call shooting with intent to kill. If Tommy does not make it, the district attorney is going to have to be looking at uh, some other charge, possibly murder, could be manslaughter. Young people oftentimes never look at the future. The only thing that a gang has to offer them is either jail or death. Very few of them ever escape out of a gang without one of those two things happening to them. I want to thank everybody for uh, coming up here. And really what I wanted to do tonight is pray, because the only thing that's going to save him now is a miracle. And uh, we really need that miracle right now. So if y'all would please pray and pray hard. God in heaven, we come to you now in Jesus' precious and holy name to ask for our friend Tommy. I feel really in my heart that he's going to make it through this. And we all pray for this miracle. That's all we're waiting on is the miracle, God. We all need this. We pray that you take care of Tommy. Amen. One week after the shooting, Tommy's older brother is at his bedside when the end comes. Both of his lungs, they finally collapse. And uh, he can't keep his body temperature on his own head. All of that was on a machine. and. Uh, he was getting pneumonia, and uh, he was, and he just finally, finally gave up. But, uh, he fought hard. He, he tried. <laughs> There were 650 people at his funeral, and I know he was special, but I didn't know he was that special to so many people. But he had touched each of their lives in some way. Three teenagers were arrested in connection with the shooting. The driver was convicted of murder, and the other two suspects are awaiting trial. A 
lot of people think it can't happen in their city, but almost every major city across the country is experiencing some gang problems. It's something that crosses all the barrier lines, and it is a community problem, and it's something that's going to take the entire community to solve. Five months later, Tommy's family struggles to cope with their loss. It's left an empty space. All of our lives have changed. There will always be the pain from his death. You never, ever think that you'll have to deal with murder. And you, when you're part of it, you die. Part of you dies when the person dies. It's plumb against nature or something. You don't never think about your kid dying. You know, it's like Christmas Day. You know, the only thing I had to look at when I was, instead of Tommy, all I had to look at was just the ground out there at the cemetery. It just feel like someone ripping your heart out of it. To the parents of the kids that are getting into trouble, the advice that I would give to them is communicate. And I would tell these parents, your kids are a gift. And to take care of it because they never know when they could lose theirs. The death of 18-year-old Tommy Bias inspired the state of Oklahoma to pass a law that makes drive-by shootings a felony, whether or not anyone is actually injured. Next. Into the abdomen and bring them inward and upward. She said something about blood coming. They were getting blood, and uh, so I knew that this, this isn't right. The Heimlich was not working. John Luther and his wife Kay tried to make their home in Honeywell, New York, a place where their children could thrive and have fun growing up. But on the evening of April 12, 1992, they were reminded just how quickly a child's playfulness can unexpectedly get out of hand. It is about a six o'clock on a Sunday evening. Shane and Kyle were um, wrestling with me. Hey guys, stop the wrestling. The house was quite cluttered with toys, so I decided I'd pick up the house. When you're a mother, you kind of listen, you know, where they're at and what they're up to. Hey, Kyle, try this. Shane, I heard him say to Kyle, Kyle, try this. I spun around to see just what he was showing Kyle to do. Shane! All of a sudden, he knew he couldn't breathe. What I saw is that Shane was gasping, kind of stamping his feet. I hit him probably two or three times on the back. That didn't work. Uh, my next reaction was to give him a Heimlich move. Shit! He hitting on the back, the Heimlich wasn't working. Tommy Fire and Ambulance. Yes, this is Kay Luther, 126 Break Road. My four-year-old son is choking to death. There's something in his throat and we can't get it out. Stay on the phone. I want to get an ambulance started. He's on I'm gonna get an ambulance started. Mike, give me a red and white going, 126 hours straight road. Help was immediately dispatched, but the advanced life support paramedics were 25 miles away at the hospital. <laughs> Murray Henry had been a dispatcher with the Ontario County Sheriff's Department for 14 years. We get these calls frequently. Usually when they say, my child is choking and they're all upset, you know, you can hear a child screaming in the background. And that's a sure sign that the child probably isn't choking. I'm in the ambulance right now. His teeth are clenched. Okay. Are you alone with him? On this one, I could hear absolutely nothing in the background. So that just clicked in that she's probably right. Her baby probably isn't breathing. All right, fire dispatcher to Honey R.A., Honey R.A., 126 hour Lake Road for a four-year-old choking. With the paramedics en route, EMTs with the Honeyoy Richmond Volunteer Rescue Squad got the ambulance from the local station and headed for the scene. You know the Heimlich 
No, he didn't try it. Okay, he did try it. Try it again. Try it again. Put the put the hands, put his fist under the ribs. Under the ribs, right into the abdomen, and bring him inward and upward. Okay. She said something about blood coming. They were getting blood, and uh, so I knew that this this isn't right. Is the child conscious? Is he conscious yet? No, no, barely. Okay. Try it again. Try it again. Mouth to mouth. Okay. He knows how to do mouth to mouth? Yeah. All right. Can he get his mouth open and clear out whatever might be in it? Can he get his mouth open and get out whatever? No, he can't. His teeth are closed. All right. All right. Fire dispatcher to Medic 60 and Honey Oi. I'm moving along on this one. The child's gone unconscious. I still have the mother on the phone. You reading that, honey? Assistant Fire Chief John Mason and his wife Sandy were closest to the scene. They reported four-year-old choking. Our tones went off, saying that it was a baby choking at 126, and I live at 131. The thing that concerned me with this one, I think, the Heimlich uh, method, which usually works, was not working. I, I tried the Heimlich maneuver, and nothing seems to be working. It won't come out. I tried to open his mouth to see an obstruction, and he proceeded to bite me and then locked up his jaw. Yeah, he's still breathing. He's still breathing. Yeah. John Mason, he says, do you know what he swallowed? And I said, no. And then he started talking to Shane and telling him to relax, to unclench his teeth. Shane did not want anybody messing with him. You know, everybody was trying to do things to him, push on his stomach, um, hitting his back. John, he says, uh, we're not going to lose you, we're not going to lose you. And at that point, I knew that he was in really big trouble. I would say it was in a state of panic at that point. I felt absolutely helpless. And it's probably the first time in 25 years in the fire service that I felt that way because of uh, not being able to correct the situation. As the ambulance headed for the hospital, they radioed to the advanced life support unit to take the same route so they could meet on the way. Rescuers treating the little boy was EMT Lee Stat. We tried the Heimlich maneuver and some abdominal thrust. It just didn't do anything. Come on, open up, slow down. His lips are blue, his fingers are getting blue on him. He's just uh, getting oxygen. That's all there is to it. 1492, the hospital wants to know if the child is breathing. I've been on a lot of calls. Sometimes a feeling will come over you where you know something tragic's gonna happen to that person. In fact, sometimes you can almost predict that they're gonna die. Ten miles from the hospital, the advanced life support unit met up at the ambulance. When paramedic Bernie Levitt took over Shane's care, he had been choking for 14 minutes. When I first jumped on board, I thought that I could go in there and get that object out and get him breathing again. But he was completely lifeless. He was blue as could be. The basic EMT that was on board he had this very fearful look in his face. And I can tell a lot by looking at the crew. And I couldn't see anything but his vocal cords. I tried to intubate the child and pass the tube through the cords, and then it would stop, like I was coming up against a brick wall with an intubation tube. The slower his heart rate went, the faster I could feel mine pounding through my chest. They had their radio on, and the ambulance, they said that he was vomiting and he was going into a cautionary code blue. John Mason turned the radio off. He said, I didn't need to hear any more. I think the scariest moment was when he 
went into respiratory arrest. He just was not breathing anymore. There was no air exchange at all. I've been doing this for 26, 27 years. It's a long time, and you're bound to see kids get killed. It doesn't sit well with you. When you see a, a youngster, in a situation like that, or... His heart rate slowed down to 40, and I knew with another 60 seconds, he'd be in cardiac arrest. At that point, I decided to do a needle crackle thoracotomy. Clear here for a second, okay? Clear. Basically, it's where you take an IV catheter needle and you stick it through his neck, and then you ventilate through that needle directly into his lungs. I've never done one on a human being before. As soon as the supplemental oxygen was getting in through the needle, it's just like turning the light on almost immediately. I could hear my monitor in the background slowly picking up, going faster and faster and faster. I could see his lips were getting bright red again. I could feel a feeling of relief over myself, but I knew that the child wasn't out of the woods yet. The peg, shaped like a golf tee, was still lodged deep in four-year-old Shane's throat when he was admitted to Thompson Hospital and put under the care of emergency physician Tom Benzotti. What happened to the young man is once he got this in his throat, it oriented so the tip was pointing down his airway. As he took a breath in, it would get sucked into his airway and eventually it lodged there. Dad may well have made a difference with his Heimlich, because he may have been able to dislodge this, perhaps not remove it, but dislodge it enough to let his child get a few more gasps of air. He started screaming at the top of his lungs, and I'll tell you what, that was music to my ears. I stood up, I said, he's okay. Shane Luther suffered no permanent injuries, but he came away from the incident a changed kid. Shane's a wiser little boy very cautious of what he plays with, what his little brother plays with. If Kyle tries to put something in his mouth, Shane's right there, takes it right away from him. It's not always a happy ending that everybody sees, like on TV. The first thing I thought of as I was working on him was my own child. How you doing? Being a father myself, thinking about the father sitting up there, looking completely shocked, I could feel what he was feeling inside. I learned to respect the ambulance crew and the other volunteers. You guys were terrific. I've learned a lot more about what Bernie does and how much of a volunteer he is. Without Bernie, there, there probably wouldn't be a shame. Daddy, I'm gonna go over and pick my... Thank you for getting that toy out of my throat. Don't play those toys anymore. Because they're small. Next. There was thick black smoke coming out of the house. I knew that anything that was inside the residence was almost certainly gone. On the morning of July 6, 1992, in St. Augustine, Florida, Lonnie Silvestri was hurrying to get her 10-year-old son, Stephen, and three other children fed and on their way. But the whole family was about to discover that one rescuer's determination to save a life would far exceed the limits of his job. Much of the footage in this story was taped as the events unfolded. Okay, everybody, let's go! We had to rush out and leave because we had to go to camp. I said goodbye to you. He's a great dog. We decided to leave him inside the house because we usually do sometimes.
emergency? We have a, a, a fire, house fire on Sebastian Street, right next to the, the early education center. Is anybody in the house? No, I don't think so. There's a dog in the house. We'll have the fire department come on out, okay? Please hurry. Okay, bye-bye. Station 151 to Sebastian. St. Augustine police officer Patricia Sims was on routine patrol just a few blocks away when the report of the fire came over her radio. There was thick black smoke coming out of the house. I knew that anything that was inside the residence was uh, almost certainly gone. Within two minutes of the call, the St. Augustine Fire Department arrived. Captain Williams, there isn't supposed to be anybody at home, but there's a dog inside. It should be a white poodle. Captain Bubba Williams was in charge of the scene. Flames were in the back kitchen part, so I went to the front and just thought I'd look in and see if there was anything in there. shook the dog and there was no response whatsoever. I could feel no breath sound and no heart action. I've been trained in this for so many years, I, I just didn't think and just went ahead and started CPR on the dog. Still nothing, no response whatsoever. Headquarters need you to notify a vet. I love animals, and I was pretty teary-eyed at, at that point. I thought it was hopeless. I, I, I knew the dog was dead. Teacher Lisa Morin and her students watched from the school nearby. And the children were asking, is Chewy going to be all right? We're saying, we don't know, but they're trying really hard. We were just hoping that they would be able to do it. As he continued to administer the CPR, the dog began to move his head. And then the dog started choking and breathing on his own. I got a heartbeat. I was just amazed. I thought then that he probably had a chance. Police called a local veterinarian, Dr. Eric Searcy, who came over to help treat Chewy. When I got there, I just assessed his condition real quick. His heart rate was in the normal range, and uh, his lungs sounded good. Captain Bubba Williams, he did exactly what I would have done as far as pumping the chest. He just did what came natural to him. He certainly saved Chewie's life. Captain Williams was very humble about the rescue, but I said, you did good, Captain. <laughs> you, you did great. Chewy suffered no permanent injuries, but the Silvestri family's losses totaled nearly $100,000. My family and my friends have given us clothes and things just to get us going again. Their love and their support have meant everything to us. That's what's pulled us through this. Because it's been an extremely difficult time, especially with the kids. We can always get another house. We can always get more clothes. You know, that's, that's trivial. All that mattered was we were all together. 
the community has pulled my leg about this. <laughs> you wouldn't believe some of the things. I can't answer a phone. Somebody isn't barking on the other end. They went out of their way to save a dog, and a lot of people wouldn't have done that, but Bubba did. If I could have talked to Cam Williams, I would say, thank you for saving Chewie's life, because I love that dog. We all depend on the quick thinking and bravery of professional rescuers to help us when we're most in need. This series is dedicated to all those caring people who know what to do in an emergency and are committed to saving lives. I'm William Shatner. Join us again next week for more true stories on Rescue 911.